this has to be one of Scott's best chapters yet. He stays in the moment. He paces it quite nicely. We're seeing through Edward's eyes, but we really are seeing through Edward's eyes. Not just what he sees, but what he thinks of what he sees. And what he sees is the Highland Army, which is relevant. So Scott wins on all fronts with this chapter. It did start, much like many other chapters, with Edward sleeping in. But that sort of makes sense, because he's been on the march for days. He's been a prisoner for days. And even though it doesn't seem like a very arduous trip, and he was looked after really well, presumably he was a bit uncomfortable and he was a bit anxious, and all of that just stops you relaxing. So here he is finally, he's sleeping in Fergus's house where he feels perfectly safe and presumably they all had a little bit to drink the night before. He's a bit exhausted from the emotional roller coaster of seeing Flora and having her quite firmly reject him. So maybe it makes sense, but all the same, here it is, his big day, all of their big days and he sleeps in. The chapter starts with him having a dream or mentioning that he is dreaming. The sound of bagpipes invades the dream and eventually wakes him up. The bagpipes are playing the McKeever song. I don't really know what that is, but it's like a national song. They had a clan song and that's playing. Edward recognises that that's what it is. And just after he wakes up, Caelan Begg enters the room. Fergus, it seems, has assigned Caleb to look after Edward. In Edward's mind, this means that Caleb Begg is like his valet, and I guess he is performing those services. He's getting his clothes ready and he's making sure he can get food. But I think really, at heart, Fergus has assigned Caleb to make sure that Edward actually stays with them and doesn't just go off in his own little dream. It said at the end of the last chapter that when Edward managed to be very social and witty and impressed everybody the night before, that Fergus was also surprised because although he had some regard for his friend, he had always thought of him as just a bit dim and a bit slow. Caleb has been assigned to Edward and Edward has woken rather late it's the sounds of the bagpipes. It seems that it was Caelan playing the bagpipes. I presume that he was doing this actually to wake Edward up because it was absolutely time Edward was awake. Edward doesn't necessarily get that. He might. It's not really clear. He certainly doesn't say anything about it if he does get it. So Caelan comes into the room and says in the sort of Scottish talk that Scott puts in this book all the way through, I'm just going to translate. He says, are you ready to get up? Fergus and the prince are away at the green with the rest of the clan and they're all getting ready to set off. Edward sprang out of bed and with Caleb's assistance and instructions, he put on the tartan that he's got, that he's still learning how to wear. He learns that his portmanteau arrived while he was asleep that morning and has been transferred onto another cart, another baggage cart, Waverly thinking he's never ever going to catch up with this portmanteau and see whatever it is that Alice put in it. But it's his own fault. He slept in. Mrs Flockhart has a bit of food for them. They eat and they set off. They walk through the town and Edward says to Caleb, what shall I do for a horse? Caleb finds this a little bit high handed of him. He says Fergus is marching on foot. Why should you have a horse? So Edward, who in his usual way, he just hadn't even thought of walking. He says, oh, that's fine. I'll walk. I'll carry my gun. It's all going to be fine. They are on the edge of Edinburgh and they walk up a hill. And from the top of this hill, they're looking down at a place called the King's Park, which is a big area of green where the Highland Army slept that night. They'd sort of camped, although a lot of them actually don't even have tents. So they just slept in the open on this big green but they're all up and they're all packing up and they're all getting ready to join their specific clans because there's a whole lot of clans here. There are many chieftains and they've all brought their people. But at this point, they're all sort of milling around, just getting into order and starting to collect in their proper groups. And Edward is at the top of the hill looking down at them. 
and we get quite a lot of description about these Highlanders, which I find perfectly relevant here. It's something we want to know. If we're going to go into battle with these people, we want to know who there is. So I was very glad to read it. He says that the rocks, because there's hills all around them and there seem to be a lot of cliffs around Edinburgh, the rocks which formed the background of the scene and the very sky itself rang with the clang of the bagpipers, summoning forth, each with his appropriate pibroch, his chieftain and clan. The mountaineers rousing themselves from their couch under the canopy of heaven with the hum and bustle of a confused and irregular multitude, like bees alarmed and arming in their hives, seem to possess all the pliability of movement fitted to execute military manoeuvres. So they're all just waking up, jumping up, starting to mill around everywhere, which is kind of what I said a minute ago, I know. Their motions appeared spontaneous and confused, but the result was order and regularity. So that a general must have praised the conclusion, though a martinet might have ridiculed the method by which it was attained. Scott goes on like this for some time. It is actually quite interesting to read. You do feel like you're there watching it, like every little movement. I don't think I need to talk about it all here, but it is quite a good chapter to read. He talks about all the banners they're starting to raise the banners and the banners are sort of flying around not in any specific order yet because they're not really in formation they're still just walking around but they're starting to look like an army rather than a rabble at length the mixed and wavering multitude arrange themselves into a narrow and dusky column of great length stretching through the whole extent of the valley in the front of the column, the standard of the Chevalier was displayed, bearing a red cross upon a white ground. The few cavalry being chiefly lowland gentry, with their domestic servants and retainers, formed the advanced guard of the army, and their standards, of which they had rather too many in respect of their numbers, were seen waving upon the extreme verge of the horizon. What you would normally see is one standard for, say, 500 men, maybe? And they don't have that many men. If they did, you'd have one standard, you'd have a whole block of men, then you might have another standard and another whole block of men. Remember, Edward is still standing on a hill looking at this from a distance. Edward spots Bally with his men. Some people are having a bit of trouble waking up. Scott tends to refer to them as loiterers. They consumed too much courage through the night. But they're now stirring as well and making their way towards their groups. While Waverley gazed upon this remarkable spectacle, and given how much happened while he's standing here watching, he's been standing here for at least a couple of minutes, rendered yet more impressive by the occasional discharge of cannon shot. The Union soldiers at Edinburgh Castle are firing on the Highlanders if they come too close. While Edward gazes upon this, Caleb reminds him that Fergus is right up the front with the prince and that's quite some distance from where they are now and they need to get moving if they want to catch them up. Edward, of course, being Edward, he'd just forgotten. He was just standing there in a daze. But at this, he stirs himself and they walk down the hill and join the group. Close up, the Highland army doesn't look so impressive. The chieftains and the main men do he feels that they look very strong very capable and very formidable but most of their men don't have full uniforms they're not properly armed the common peasantry of the highland country who although they did not allow themselves to be so called and claimed themselves to be of ancient descent wore the livery of extreme penury worse armed half naked stinted in growth and miserable in aspect they were very sparingly fed, ill-dressed and worse armed. The latter circumstance was indeed owing chiefly to the General Disarming Act, which had been carried into effect ostensibly through the whole Highlands. A lot of Highland clans have been dispossessed of land or at least rendered very, very poor through centuries of war. They're now existing due to the charity of wealthier and more important clans in the way that Fergus is taking on all the men that he can because he's trying to raise this army. He will feed any Highlander who turns up 
if they will join him, if they will become like a subsidiary clan member, like a foster kin. It's very much a feudal arrangement. And what Scott is describing here are the lesser clans that are attached to the major ones. When the Disarming Act was implemented, soldiers came through to remove all the weaponry from the chieftains in the highlands and to protect their own weaponry and to make it look like they had given up everything, what they did was they ordered the subsidiary clans to give up their weaponry. The subsidiary clans kind of had to do that because they were living off these more wealthy clans. They needed their charity, they had no choice. But the result is that those subsidiary clans here in this army are now weaponless. So that's something that Scott explains in this chapter. The rear of this army, Scott says, resembled actual banditti. Here was a pole axe, there a sword without a scabbard, here a gun without a lock, there a side set straight upon a pole, and some had only their dirks and bludgeons or stakes pulled out of hedges. The grim, uncombed and wild appearance of these men, most of whom gazed with all the admiration of ignorance upon the most ordinary production of domestic art, created surprise in the lowlands, but it also created terror. So little was the condition of the highlands known at that late period that the character and appearance of their population surprised the South Country lowlanders as much as if an invasion of African Negroes or Eskimo Indians had issued forth from the northern mountains of their own native country. So they had no idea. The highlanders have stayed in the highlands and they're basically just wild, very tribal. They're living with Neanderthal conditions in the highlands. It's subsistence only because they just had so much stripped from them for so long that they sort of vanished into the mountains for their own protection and lived wild, as it were. So even the lowland Scottish people who are their own countrymen didn't know that there were people living that way. But they're seeing them now, these wild men of the highlands. Edward and Caleb are walking up the column. Now the column is, of course, all the soldiers in a row that go the whole length of the valley. They're not walking yet. They're just still gathering together in their own little groups. It sort of reminds me, actually, of school assemblies. Like years ago, we used to do this big march before athletic carnivals where the whole school would sort of assemble in the class groups because there had been sporting events in the morning. So, you know, the running and the long jumps and such things and then you have lunch and everyone would be just scattered around and then after lunch you'd have the march the teachers would be there and all the class would you'd come and find your own class and the the top class was the front and the little kindy kids are right at the back this reminds me of the same thing with all the soldiers sort of milling around and packing their stuff up and taking their place yeah, it really, it really reminds me of that. That's probably not what I'm meant to be thinking of. It's supposed to seem much more formidable, but it's the same sort of thing. They're all coming together in the line and the column is not moving yet. So they're just standing there with their packs on their backs and their weapons on their shoulders, whatever, whatever they have. They're just standing there ready to take those first steps when they're given the instruction. Edward and Caleb are walking up the side of them heading towards the front, but they're only halfway along when the signal is given to start walking. So they have some kind of big gun. It, they've only got one of these, and the prince actually didn't think it was much use to them, but the Highland chieftains are very attached to it. They have fired this artillery weapon as the signal to start off. No sooner was its voice heard upon the present occasion than the whole line was in motion. A wild cry of joy from the advancing battalions rent the air and then was lost in the shrill clangour of the bagpipes as the sound of these, in their turn, was partially drowned by the heavy tread of so many men put at once into motion. The banners glittered and shook as they moved forward and the horse chastened to occupy their station as the advanced guard. They vanished from Waverley's eye. The infantry followed in the same direction. Scott concludes this chapter by saying it took Edward some exertion of activity to catch up with the Prince and Fergus, which is the place he was supposed to be in. My thoughts, as I said at the start, we stay in the moment, this fantastic description. For once I feel like I'm there. For once it seems that Edward is there looking at exactly what we need him to look at so that 
we know what's going on. We can see that the Highlanders have a chance, but there are 4,000 of them apparently, which isn't a huge army, not when you think of all the men that England can raise. So they've got a massive fight on their hands. They don't have many weapons, but they're certainly motivated, and among them are some excellent fighters. Now, I don't know if it's going to say in this book, but from the reading I did yesterday, I learned that although the Highland forces are somewhat meagre, the prince is actually hoping that troops will join them from France. And I think he's depending on those more than on the Highlanders right now. Because any troops from France are going to be properly disciplined, well-trained, well-armed, and he will know how to command them very well because he's come from that. His General Sullivan has also come from that. So they will work very well together. They've just got to hold whatever ground they can until those troops arrive. Edward obviously doesn't know anything of this. Maybe that's why we don't, and maybe it's not going to be relevant anyway. I don't know. But I do know from reading it that that's what the prince was thinking at this point. Edward doesn't seem to have any real thoughts about this. You'd think he would, because he's seen British troops. He was one of them, so he knows what the British army is like. But maybe he's just too busy looking and walking fast to catch up. Anyway, I'm very interested to see what comes next, and that's something else Scott has done well. He's, it's motivated me to read on. Chapter 45. At first I thought this was going to be a very slow chapter, because the first two pages, they're just walking. And all we know here is, they walk through a little village called Duddingston, they go up into the hills, and then they head to a place called Carberry. And it occurred to me that I actually don't know where they're going. I don't know if Edward knows where they're going. I didn't see why they're going anywhere, because the Union soldiers were there in Edinburgh, and that's where there was the cannon fire, so why are they leaving Edinburgh? But apparently, the Prince had received some intelligence that there were British troops about to land at Aberdeen near Dundee. Those troops were going to land there and then march into Edinburgh, presumably with an idea of taking the Highland soldiers by surprise. So the Prince's plan was to go up into the hills, hide up in the hills and ambush them before they could get there. So if he took out this army that's just got off the boat, they might not be so together and he might be able to at least prevent reinforcements from reaching Edinburgh. So presumably after that, if they took out this army, their plan is then to double back to Edinburgh and take out the people there, knowing that reinforcements are not on their way, which makes a lot of sense. Now they get to Carberry and they stop there sort of for lunch and to camp. They send out advance parties to see what's ahead of them. Edward is with Fergus and Fergus gets a message to come and talk to the prince because one of the advance parties, which is headed by the Baron of Bradwardine, who is Tully, has had an encounter with some Union troops and has taken some prisoners. So Fergus dashes off and Edward follows him because Edward has no notion of waiting until he's invited. He just does this. He was following behind when going past a hovel... So there's obviously buildings here. I'd imagined it just to be forest and field, but there are little farmhouses. Anyway, he went past a hovel and he heard a groan from in the hovel. Somebody in there was trying to say the Lord's Prayer in English. He hadn't heard anybody speaking English, like all, all the English he's heard is really sort of broad Scottish English, but this was just the normal regular English that he knows. So he stopped, he realised this was somebody in great pain, and he goes in. And he finds a soldier who's actually been stripped of all his clothes and everything, and he's only been left his cloak. He's badly injured, he's bleeding heavily. And the wounded man says, For the love of God, give me a single drop of water. You shall have it, answered Waverley, at the same time raising him in his arms, bearing him to the door of the hut, and giving him some drink from his flask. I should know that voice, said the man, but looking on Waverley's dress with a bewildered look, no, this is not the young squire, 
This was the common phrase by which Edward was distinguished on the estate of Waverley Honour, and the sound now thrilled to his heart with the thousand recollections which the well-known accents of his native country had already contributed to awaken. Horton, he said, gazing on the ghastly features which death was fast disfiguring, can this be you? And it is, it's Humphrey Horton, his main man who Major Melville asked him about. Horton says he never thought to hear an English voice again. He says, but squire, how could you stay away from us so long and let us be tempted by that fiend of the pit ruffin? We should have followed you through flood and fire, to be sure. So it all comes out, this plot to force his men to rebel. Humphrey then says, he brought your seal to prove that he really did come from you. It turns out it was exactly as I was conjecturing earlier, that Donald had taken the seal. Now, it was Fergus who said that. No, it wasn't. It was, Flora. it was Flora who said that. He was using it in just the way I thought he would. Because Horton's dying, Edward isn't really thinking so much about that. But he does say it. And so Edward says, that wasn't me. It was a trick. You've been imposed upon. And Humphrey says, I actually thought that must have been it. Even though it didn't seem likely, I couldn't believe you would do that to us. And then Edward said, don't exhaust your strength, I'll get you a surgeon. So he dashes out and finds Fergus and says, we need a doctor, we need a doctor. Which just goes to show how little he understands about the world. Even after being in that regiment for some weeks, he was there in Dundee as a captain. But it doesn't occur to him that this just isn't something you do. Anyway, it did work out. Because Fergus first says... A thousand men are going to bleed to death before nightfall, and we don't have any doctors. What do you think we can do? Edward says, he's the son of a tenant of my father's. And then Fergus says, oh, if he's a follower of yours, he must be looked to. I'll send Caleb. Caleb comes along, and when they discovered that this man is a follower of Edward's, they're actually just very impressed, and he rises in their estimation because... That's what any chieftain should do for his men, whatever side they've ended up on. A chieftain should always watch out for their followers and look after them and give them all the support they can. So they all help him. They do everything that they can for Humphrey Horton, but Humphrey dies. This is the first time Edward has ever seen anyone die, and he's rather shocked by it. He's extra shocked because it is Humphrey, someone he's known all his life. Although, as he said before... He wouldn't actually associate with someone of that rank. He has known him all his life and he feels a bit responsible. After this, they move him into the hut and carry on. Nobody else waited for them. Everybody else is already marching on. So it takes them a little while to regain their place in the column, the marching column. But they do it. And as they're walking along now, Edward can't stop thinking about Humphrey and Humphrey's death and the part that he himself had to play in that. He's feeling a great deal of remorse. of the seal he now for the first time recollected and that he had lost it in the cavern of the robber Donald the bandit. The repeated expostulation of Horton, ah squire why did you leave us, rung like a knell in his ears. Yes he said, I have indeed acted towards you with thoughtless cruelty. I brought you from your paternal fields and the protection of a generous and kind landlord, and when I had subjected you to all the rigour of military discipline, I shunned to bear my own share of the burden, and wandered from the duties I had undertaken, leaving alike those whom it was my business to protect, and my own reputation, to suffer under the artifices of villainy. O oh, indolence and indecision of mind, if not in yourselves vices, to how much exquisite misery and mischief do you frequently prepare the way? So there you have it. Edward is finally starting to see sense. He's finally developing a sense of responsibility, which was lacking. And that's the end of the chapter. 
it's very good to see Edward finally waking up. It's nice to see that there's something of a character arc beginning to take place. And something that I forgot to mention at the start of this chapter was when he first caught up to Fergus, Fergus was saying, it might look like I don't have many men here, but I've actually sent a whole lot out in advanced parties. And so you're not seeing the full force of them here. But Scott tells us that Fergus is a bit embarrassed. He's only got about 300 men here and he expected to have a lot more. The defection of Donald the Bandit has hit him hard. Donald the Bandit, he thought, was going to bring him at least 30 more men. I find that, well, for one thing, I guess 30 men isn't to be sneezed at, but it's not a huge force. But I didn't realise that Donald had defected. I know Fergus wasn't happy with him because he was going out and collecting his own blackmail. But, yeah, I gather he's actually, they're just not friends anymore. Donald is playing his own long game. The other thing is, some of the men that he thought were his men that he was feeding and looking after at Glenacoit actually felt allegiance to other chieftains who just happened to be really poor or weren't there at the time and those chieftains called them back so they had to leave Fergus and go back to their proper clans and that has reduced his forces as well. He's still got 300 men and they're still trained as well as French soldiers because Fergus was raised in France and he knows how to do that and I think it's very cool to see Edward finally starting to realise who he is and what he has done. And that's it. Chapter 46. It's just getting better and better. It's very late in the day when they reach the place they were aiming for, which is an area of highland from which you can see the sea near the villages of Preston and Seaton. I'm not entirely sure where they are. Their plan was to get here before the ships landed, bringing the British troops, but they actually missed that. When they top the rise, the British troops are actually right there below them. So the setting is, there's the sea, and then there's a strip of lowlands, just, I think it's about a mile between the sea and the foothills, and they're on a hill. So, like, they're not on a high mountain, they're only on a hill that's just near the sea. It's only, we're looking at it distance of total a bit over a mile a very short distance when the highlanders reached the heights above the plain described they were immediately formed in a ray of battle along the brow of the hill almost at the same instant the van of the english appeared issuing from among the trees and enclosures of seaton with the purpose of occupying the level plain between the high ground and the sea the space which divided the armies being only about half a mile in breadth that's a great scene. You often see it in movies from the other perspective. You're one of those soldiers on the ground and when you look up at the hill you can see all the enemy just silhouetted on the top. And that's exactly what we've got here, only we are with those men on the hill who are just appearing as silhouettes to the British soldiers below. Waverley could plainly see the squadrons of dragoons issue one after another with their vedettes in front and form upon the plain, with their front opposed to that of the prince's army. They were followed by a train of field pieces, which, when they reached the flank of the dragoons, were also brought into line and pointed against the heights. The march was continued by three or four regiments of infantry marching in open column, their fixed bayonets showing like successive hedges of steel, and their arms glancing like lightning, as at a signal given, they also at once wheeled up and were placed in direct opposition to the Highlanders. A second train of artillery with another regiment of horse closed the long march and formed on the left flank of the infantry, the whole line facing southward. So they're pretty impressive. They're all armed and they're all disciplined and they've got horses and everything. While the English army went through these evolutions, the Highlanders showed equal promptitude and zeal for battle. As fast as the clans came up upon the ridge which fronted their enemy, they were formed into line so that both armies got into complete order of battle at the same time. When this was accomplished, the Highlanders set up a tremendous yell which was re-echoed by the heights behind them. The regulars, the regulars seemed to be the British army, 
who were in high spirits, returned a loud shout of defiance and fired one or two of their cannon upon an advanced post of the Highlanders. The latter displayed great earnestness to proceed instantly to the attack. Evan Dew is at the head of these people. He just wants to charge down there and get them. But even though they're quite close and they can see the British troops very easily, the ground between is marshy and has little walls of dry stone and it's difficult ground to get over. They couldn't actually race over it easily. So the order is given that they are not to attack yet. The two armies, so different in aspect and discipline, yet each admirably trained in its own peculiar mode of war, now faced each other like two gladiators in the arena, each meditating upon the mode of attacking their enemy. Scott points out that the outcome of this battle could decide the war, which is, I guess, the case for any battle in any war, really. But perhaps more particularly back in these days where there weren't so many people fighting. And I thought that was a cool idea, one that I'd never really thought of, because when you see modern war, which happens everywhere, you sort of don't really know what other people are doing. And I doubt you really have that feel that you are making a big difference to the war in general. Whereas back here, every little skirmish actually did have consequence. And I never quite understood that before, how if you were a common soldier here, you would really feel like you were in the middle of history. You would really feel how you yourself performed could actually impact everything. And that was an experience that the common man never really had. So this is one way that you could actually feel like you were a part of something important. I never quite got that before, but Scott does bring that out quite well here. So the Highlanders on the hill and the British soldiers down below are both all lined up facing each other. The leading officers and the general staff of each army could be distinguished in front of their lines, busied with spy glasses to watch each other's motions, and occupied in dispatching the orders and receiving the intelligence conveyed by the aides de camp and orderly men, who gave life to the scene by galloping along in different directions as if the fate of the day depended upon the speed of their horses. The space between the armies was at times occupied by the partial and irregular contests of individual sharpshooters. And every so often, one of them does hit someone on the other side, but this isn't really the way they intend to conduct this war. So nobody is actually given the order to fire. It's just every so often somebody makes the most of an opportunity they have. From the neighbouring hamlets, the peasantry cautiously showed themselves as if watching the issue of the expected engagement, and at no great distance in the bay were two square-rigged vessels bearing the English flag whose tops and yards were crowded with less timid spectators. When this awful pause had lasted for a short time, Fergus, with another chieftain, received orders to detach their clans towards the village of Preston, in order to threaten the right flank of Cope's army and compel him to a change of position. Fergus chooses a churchyard in this village of Preston to base himself. Evan Do thinks that this is quite funny because he thinks if you happen to be an Englishman, you're in the right place to die. This churchyard seems to place them even closer to the enemy army than when they were on the hill. The English army has noticed that they've gone here and decides to try to root them out of this churchyard. The English general detached two guns, escorted by a strong party of cavalry. They approached so near that Waverley could plainly recognise the standard of the troop he had formerly commanded, and hear the trumpets and kettle drums sound the signal of advance, which he had so often obeyed. He could hear too the well-known word given in the English dialect by the equally well-distinguished voice of the commanding officer, for whom he had once felt so much respect. It was at that instant that, looking around him, he saw the wild dress and appearance of his Highland associates, heard their whispers in an uncouth and unknown language, looked upon his own dress, so unlike that which he had worn from his infancy, 
and wished to awake from what seemed at the moment a dream, strange, horrible and unnatural. Good God, he muttered, am I then a traitor to my country, a renegade to my standard and a foe, as that poor dying wretch expressed himself to my native England? Ere he could digest or smother the recollection, the tall military form of his late commander came full in view for the purpose of reconnoitring. I could hit him now, said Caleb, cautiously raising his gun. Edward felt as if he was about to see a parricide committed in his presence, for the venerable grey hair and striking countenance of the veteran recalled the almost paternal respect with which his officers universally regarded him. But ere he could say hold, an aged Highlander who lay beside Caelan Beck stopped his arm. Spare your shot, said the seer, his hour is not yet come. Colonel Gardiner, unconscious of the danger he had escaped, turned his horse around and rode slowly back to the front of his regiment. Anyway, they decide they're not going to take out the men in the churchyard and it's getting close to dark now. In these days they couldn't really fight at night, they didn't really have good lights. Both the armies are setting up camp just half a mile apart. There will be nothing done tonight, said Fergus to his friend Waverley. Ere we wrap ourselves in our plaids, let us go see what the Baron is doing. So while everybody's sort of setting up camp and just settling down to have something to eat and get some rest, Fergus and Edward go to find Tully. When they approached his post, they found the good old careful officer, after having sent out his night patrols and posted his sentinels, engaged in reading the evening service of the Episcopal Church to the remainder of his troop. His voice was loud and sonorous, and though his spectacles upon his nose and the appearance of Saunders Saunderson in military array performing the functions of Clark had something ludicrous, yet the circumstances of danger in which they stood, the military costume of the audience, and the appearance of their horses saddled and picketed behind them, gave an impressive and solemn effect to the office of devotion. So Fergus and Edward wait while Tully conducts this service. And I thought this was a fantastic scene. It seems like this is the right thing to do before a battle. And after the service, they go up close to talk to him. Fergus and Edward ask him what he thinks of their situation. And I'm not sure how to say what he says because he says it with a whole lot of random bits of Latin, which is his way. The gist of it is, it could go either way. But credit me, gentlemen, yon man is not a deacon of his craft. This is referring to the enemy commander. I think this meant Cope. He was the one that went the wrong way before and left the loans undefended. So they don't think much of him. Tully says he is not a deacon of his craft. He damps the spirits of the poor lads he commands by keeping them on the defensive. Wilk of itself implies inferiority or fear. Now they will lie on their arms yonder as anxious and as ill at ease as a toad under a harrow, while our men will be quite fresh and blithe for action in the morning. Well, good night. One thing troubles me, but if tomorrow goes well off, I will consult you about it, Glenacoich. Fergus and Edward leave him then. Fergus says, I wonder what can be troubling his mind. Probably something about Rose. Hark, the English are setting their watch. It's night time by now. It's completely dark. So they're just walking through the dark with, they've got presumably a little torch or something, but maybe they're just going by the light of the moon. And they're hearing sounds. The roll of the drum and shrill accompaniment of the fife swelled up the hill, died away, resumed its thunder, and was at length hushed. The trumpets and kettle drums of the cavalry were next heard to perform the beautiful and wild point of war, appropriated as a signal for that piece of nocturnal duty, and then finally sunk upon the wind with a shrill of mournful cadence. The friends who had now reached their post stood and looked around them ere they lay down to rest. The western sky twinkled with stars, but a frost mist rising from the ocean covered the eastern horizon and rolled in white wreaths along the plain where the adverse army lay couched upon their arms. Their advanced posts were pushed as far as the side of the great ditch at the bottom of the descent, 
and had kindled large fires at different intervals, gleaming with obscure and hazy lustre through the heavy fog which encircled them with a doubtful halo. The highlanders lay stretched upon the ridge of the hill, buried, except the sentinels, in the most profound repose. I had to read that out. I think that's a fantastic piece of writing. I shouldn't mention Tolkien again, should I? But, you know, it's got all of that magic. It's got that feel of the night, the mist and the cold creeping in on them. And they can sort of see that the enemy have lit these fires, but there's a halo around them. And this presumably is what Edward is perceiving. Edward says something about, I wonder how many of these people will die tomorrow. Fergus says, it's too late to think about that. So they all settle down to sleep. Calum sitting down at their head, for it was his duty to watch upon the immediate person of the chief, began a long mournful song in Gaelic, to a low and uniform tune, which, like the sound of the wind at a distance, soon lulled them to sleep. And that's the end of the chapter. So my thoughts. It's getting better and better. We're in the moment. We're really in the moment. Everything's being described beautifully. I love all that. I also like that here he is on the other side looking at his old colonel. I really like that he's got this struggle going on. That he's suddenly kind of woken up to where he is and he's wondering what he's doing here. I also like that I don't see the way out. I can't imagine how he can extricate himself if that's what he should be doing. I can't even decide what the right thing to do in this situation is. I think this is something Scott has done well, although it's kind of by intimation rather than that he's put it in. He's presented both sides as being good, and I think this is what he set out to do. He wanted to show that the Highlanders were not savages, that the Highlanders were as honourable as the other side. Here is Edward. What should he do? He has committed himself to the prince, so presumably he has to keep his word. But at some point before that, when he first joined that British regiment, although he didn't really choose to do it, he must have sworn an oath there too. Perhaps it would have been better for Scott to put that in so that we can really see where he's at. But knowing Edward the way we do, we can see how he came into this. And he's only a kid. He's like 18, 19. And one who didn't actually have any guidance. Like, nobody really trained him up in any kind of principles. So you've got to feel sympathy for him. I mean, I do. I do feel sympathy for him. And I don't know what he should do because it seems to me that he's given up a lot to be here without thinking about it, without knowing he's done that, without realising what he was doing. And there probably is no going back. But Scott obviously has a plan. I doubt this book would be called Waverley if he actually dies before the end or if he doesn't have some kind of triumphant result i can't imagine what that is at this stage but i like that i really like that i don't know how he's going to get out of this mess and so i'll leave it there mm -hmm.